And here we are, this is the home of FIFA in Zurich, Switzerland, FIFA's headquarters. And we would like to welcome you to another edition of Living Football. Today we are looking forward to talk to one of the best goalkeepers of all time, Peter Czech. FIFA's new medical director, former team doctor at Liverpool FC, Andy Messi. He will join us here in the studio and we will take a look back at the Olympic football draw. So thank you for joining us wherever you are. So this is Living Football episode number six and you've already met FIFA president Gianni Infantino in this program. You've met our FIFA's chief of global football development, Arsene Wenger, FIFA's chairman of the referee commission, Pierluigi Colina, the CEO of the FIFA foundation, Yuri Djorkaev, all well-known experts in their field. And the most recent new signing was also a real coup. He joined FIFA last year from Anfield after winning the Champions League and the Championship with Liverpool FC as the Master of Medicine from Northern Ireland. Welcome, Andy Messi. Thank you, Jessica. Lovely to be invited. Andy, you are a very familiar face to English football fans. You've been sitting on the bench every week as Liverpool FC's Head of Medical Services. Uh, you'll never walk alone. Okay, that's for sure. Um, what are your most vivid memories working alongside FIFA's best men's coach, Jurgen Klopp? We were very fortunate um, over, over the entire time I was there to be quite successful with Jurgen whenever he was there. And he delivered some unbelievable experiences, especially at Anfield and especially around what we call the European nights at Anfield, whenever the crowds were there and the atmosphere was unbelievable. We had the, the match against Barcelona when you can remember the, the, the players and the staff all lining up in front of the cop. We had matches against Dortmund where we had another comeback then as well against City and the, you know, the, the, the whole event, the drive to the stadium whenever supporters are hanging out of their houses, um, setting off flares and setting them all up. We're, we're brilliant but that's the that's, that, that's, that's Jürgen's side of things and the player side of things. They're, they're the people that deliver the success. I was, I was just the doctor. So my, my experiences of working with Jürgen were more around changing, actually throughout, the, at that stage of my career, changing what I thought footballers were capable of, the parameters that they were able to produce uh, during matches and during training over season upon season upon season and, and we had to change what we thought we, we would do with the players to make them as robust as possible and to make them the optimal athletes that they could be so that Jürgen could then use them to, to deliver the success that he, he needed. I mean, you have an outstanding experience. You've been a professional footballer yourself in Northern Ireland. And before joining Liverpool FC, you worked with the Irish Football Association um, as national team doctor. So what motivated you to join FIFA after an amazing career at international and club level? The, it, it's the reach that FIFA has whenever you're working with international teams or club teams. It's very much a bit of a closed book. You maybe have 25, 30 players in a first team. You've maybe got 200 kids at the academy. Um, and then similar for the, the women's setup. So all in, there's maybe four or 500 people that you can influence. Um, FIFA has a global reach um, and it goes beyond that elite level. Um, I saw FIFA as a platform to actually build things that will outlast me ever working here but you know can we um, improve global life for everyone can we think of strategies that will help the the obesity pandemic that we have in the world increase physical activity if you increase those then you're going to help with the cardiovascular disease or, or, or any disease that's related to physical activity so if we can find some way to do that that's a benefit and that's what you know, I really want to get my teeth in to, with FIFA, have a more of a global appeal to everyone who plays football, increase the participation in football through all the sexes, all the genders, um, all the age groups, and see if that will then give health benefits um, as the outcome. And you joined the organisation as FIFA's medical director in very challenging times, speaking of the pandemic. FIFA was quick to set up a COVID relief fund. In October then an international return to play protocol was published. How can FIFA help to protect players around the world either on the allied or grassroots levels? 
the, the, the president was brilliant on the front foot at, uh, at the start of COVID to say that health comes first and that message has been brought right through even until now. You mentioned about the International Match Protocol and that was um, a, a booklet that we developed to try and bring the international football match calendar to keep going. Um, but at the bottom line, the health does still come first and unfortunately in this day and age, playing football does come with some risks. So in uh, association with the International Match Protocol, we also developed a risk assessment tool, which mm -hmm. is a fantastic tool that can be um, used in, in any setting, be it elite level, um, national competitions, right down to the grassroots level. And it's open to everyone, so anybody can use it. If they want to play a football match, they can use this risk assessment tool and find out how they decrease the risk of maybe transmitting COVID-19 mm -hmm. to other people, or it'll give ideas and tools to mitigate that risk um, and hopefully bring that risk as close to zero as possible. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that we, we work with the, the experts in the World Health Organization um, to find the things that everybody knows about COVID, the, the, the physical distancing, the hygiene measures, the wearing of masks, the tests and tracing. These are all things that fit in. And now we're looking at the vaccine um, uh, distribution and the equitable distribution of vaccines. And there is another pressing issue that we want to talk about. I mean, you've established an independent football concussion advisory group. You've joined the FA's research task force. Um, you're one of the greatest experts when it comes to concussions. From a medical perspective, why should more attention be paid to concussions in football? The concussion question basically comes down to that we in the past have not assessed the gravity of what concussion is and whenever I'm speaking about it I tell people yes concussion is an issue but if we change the terminology from concussion to brain injury mm -hmm. straight away people set up and think well this is a little bit more serious so highlighting the importance of it the gravity the seriousness of brain injuries concussion injuries is is paramount in my job at FIFA because we need to find ways that will decrease the incidence of it and improve our management of it as well. The FIFA Club World Cup was the first international competition to implement the trial and the trials have been now realized by over 50 competition organizers. Please tell us something about these trials and what are the options? So the trials, the basis of the trials is to try and change the narrative around concussion, try and change the importance. Um, we go with the tagline if in doubt, sit them out. If you think that somebody has possibly suffered a concussive injury, then they need to be removed from play. We have to have zero risk whenever it comes to concussion. You mentioned about the Independent Concussion Advisory Board that we have at FIFA now. Interestingly, it's made up of different types of doctors and lay members. One of the lay members, unfortunately, his son at 14 died because of concussion. So they're able to tell that personal opinion on it. So the trials are trying to prevent something like that happening. But there's a scale of what concussion can do. As I mentioned earlier, it can cause long term effects. So we have to take it seriously. If we think that somebody has suffered a concussive injury or if we've seen on the video replays um, that the mechanism of the injury is enough to worry you to think about concussion, then our advice and the trials are put in place to support you take that player away. Or if you assess a player on a pitch and you think you maybe need another 15 minutes to keep an eye on this player, take him out and then the team are allowed to bring on another player in its place and it won't affect how many substitutes they've either used or already used. So towards the end of a match, um, you may be in a position where all the substitutes have been used and it shouldn't come into consideration, but we're not human if we don't think it doesn't come into consideration that taking a player out will leave your team with 10 men. This negates that human factor that I was talking about and takes a little bit of pressure off the medics who are dealing with that. What was the toughest decision you ever had to make as team doctor of Liverpool FC? With regards to concussion, I actually had two. I um, removed a player from a cup final once who um, didn't want to come off. Um, but the most recent one was actually uh, the season before last and we were fighting for the Premier League at the time. Um, we had the second leg of the Champions League semi-final on the Wednesday, this was on a Saturday match, and our leading goal scorer um, suffered a concussive injury. Um, I went on to him 
uh, and through the assessment, he knew straight away that he needed to be removed. And it would be. And rem- it was Mo Salah. It was. It would be remiss of me to say, you know, the thought of taking this player off. We weren't winning the match. We needed to win the match to win the league. Um, and we had the Champions League coming up. That went through my head. It shouldn't have done because the decision should be straightforward. But I'm just given experiences that it definitely went through my head. Andy, um, there, there is another example. If you think about the World Cup final 2014, Christoph Kramer. The player didn't leave the pitch for about 15 minutes and then he asked the referee, is this the final? So if you remember seeing these pictures as a doctor, uh, what went through your mind? It's very easy watching those pictures, especially whenever you can slow it down like that. From a doctor point of view, we look at what we call the yellow and red flags and and Christoph displayed red flags of of a concussive injury, the posture he took, how he landed on the floor, how he looked whenever he was being assessed. So having the replays like that are, are paramount because often in football matches, you miss these. You have people walking in front of you. Even if you sit in the front row, you've got the manager or the coach in front of you, you have the referee's assistants, you have people warming up. So it's easy to miss those. So in, in, in 2013, I developed the, the pitch side video replays that we would have brought to every single match. So we had them and now lots of leagues have these. So the doctor can look at the mechanism, can see exactly that happening and make their decision straight away. That that's a concussive injury. You need to remove that player. You need to treat them acutely, first of all, and make sure that they're safe, and then you need to remove them. So all FIFA competitions will have these video replays. All FIFA competitions will have concussion spotters in the stand that will go through all of these that can relay the information to the team benches if that is needed. Um, And it'll just make things an awful lot safer. So you expect to have one concussive incident every 12 matches statistically. So this is the one side of concussions. Beyond concussion, what can we say about the link between heading and brain injuries? What we need to find out is what is what is it that they're doing within football that's causing it? We think it is heading. We think heading has a role to play in it, but it's very difficult to set up a scientific study Mm -hmm. where you will take a player and recreate them heading, especially in the younger people, recreate this and get that exact link between, say, heading and brain injuries. What we are doing at FIFA is looking at all the aspects with that, you know, how much of an impact a football will have at different pressures in a ball, how much of an impact different sizes of footballs will have, um, working with other organisations as well to try and get the answers for it. The bottom line is that heading is part of football and if there is a risk associated with heading, then we have to be open with it and let people make their own decision about whether A, they want to play football or B, they want to head the ball during football. That's very simple. We do have to think about the younger age groups who maybe aren't in a position to make that informed, consensual decision and protect them. Why did you also make tackling the issue of mental health a key objective of FIFA's medical subdivision? The, the, the discipline of sports medicine, and especially football medicine, is essentially a young discipline. Um, so the scientific evidence behind lots of the stuff that we do is not on a par, say, with, with oncology or, or the other disciplines of medicine. We've catching up to do. So in order to be, uh, you know, to congratulate ourselves for the work that football medicine have done, I prefer going the other way and saying, well, what have we not done? Where are the gaps within the literature? What do we need to do to help? So concussion and brain injury is a massive one at the moment. Mental health is another one. It was a taboo subject until five, ten years ago. People didn't like talking about it. It was a sign of weakness. So we bring it out into the open now and we try and help people or you know, think of coping strategies or think of ways that we can address the mental health issue. It's massively prevalent within football whether it's at the elite level you know it takes an awful lot for someone to play a football match and have 50,000 supporters boo him you know or shout obscenities at him you know that has to affect you mentally and then as you work down the football pyramid you might have you know teenagers going through academy systems basing their whole life around football and then being told 
perhaps they're not good enough for it. You know, that weighs an awful lot on it. Um, and the further you go down the pyramid, I say the more prevalent it becomes. So can we use football to tackle this? Can we use football to help with our resources to, to, to treat mental health issues? But coming back to concussions and brain injuries, um, there has already been some progress on that field. What incident, for example, changed the concussion rule in England? The, as I say, that's, it's a developing field. It's, it, it, it's very fluid. We, um, the, the, maybe the, the most prominent incident happened back around about 2006 with Peter Cech whenever. It was the first incident that I can remember that a player resulted in a fractured skull. Um, and we can all remember the pictures of whenever that happened. I think it was, he, he, he received a knee to his head whenever he came out to save it. And following on from that, certainly within the Premier League, we changed our concussion protocols and we changed the way we educate and manage the, the, the acute injury, the acute emergency, as it turns out to be, um, for that exact injury. And, and, you know, whilst I would say that we still have um, a l very large distance to go to make everything perfect, there are also examples now of, of people who are unfortunately suffering you know, fractured skulls through impact on a football pitch that are being managed the best way possible. Um, we're not going to be able to stop the impacts happening, unfortunately. We can try and limit them, but football is still a contact game, so we've got to be absolutely on point about how we manage them and how we re rehabilitate them. Andy, it was great talking to you. Thank you for giving us all this information, and I think now we've become a little bit more uh, experts as well on this field. Thank you very much. Thank Andy you. Messi, Thank FIFA's you. new medical director. We also have the chance now to speak to Christoph Kramer, FIFA World Cup winner 2014 from Germany. Hello Christoph, we can Deutsch miteinander sprechen gerne. Sag mal, welche Erinnerungen sind denn geblieben an diesen Abend im Maracana Stadion? Ein außergewöhnlicher Abend am Ende dann mit Happy End. Also eigentlich bis auf so eine halbe Stunde plus minus eigentlich alles. Also ähm, nach dem Zusammenprall, danach ist es weg, bis ich dann irgendwann äh, in der Kabine wieder so zu mir gekommen bin. Ich glaube, ich habe irgendwas zum Riechen bekommen und dann ging es wieder. Und danach weiß ich auch wieder alles. Es ist halt nur diese kleine Sequenz, die mir fehlt. Wie bewertest du als einer, der schon mal betroffen war, die Bestrebungen der FIFA und die jetzige Testphase für zusätzliche Auswechslungen? Ja, es ist, glaube ich, ein äh, wichtiges Thema, wobei ich sagen muss, in meinem Fall, äh, heute sage ich natürlich, boah, Glück gehabt, dass da nicht mehr was passiert ist und Glück gehabt, dass ich nicht nochmal einen vom Kopf bekommen habe und dann womöglich äh, was echt was Schlimmes passiert wäre. Ähm, aber ich muss natürlich äh, sagen, dass es nicht immer so einfach ist, ne? weil ich war klar ansprechbar. Ich habe äh, denen alle Fragen beantwortet, den äh, Ärzten und Physiotherapeuten. Und äh, von daher, ich hatte einen klaren Blick. Und von daher, äh, glaube ich, haben die Physiotherapeuten ja das Go gegeben, dass es weitergeht. Ich habe auch ganz normal äh, weitergespielt. Alle äh, motorischen Fähigkeiten waren auch noch da. Und von daher ist es, glaube ich, sehr schwer, irgendwie herauszufiltern, äh, wann man wirklich so eine Gehirnerschütterung hat und wann nicht. Und äh, von daher mh, ist das ein schmaler Grad. Aber natürlich äh, würde ich jetzt immer zur Vorsicht appellieren, weil es einfach eine eine gefährliche Geschichte ist. Aber natürlich im WM-Finale möchte man dann auch irgendwie auch das Unterbewusstsein wahrscheinlich unbedingt weiterspielen. Ähm, aber trotzdem, äh, glaube ich, ist es ein wichtiges Thema, mh, was jetzt eine Bühne immer mehr findet, weil das schon eine Gefahr ist. Es ist hypothetisch, klar, aber du kennst die Situation. Wird es für Spieler dadurch leichter, wenn sie wissen, dass das Auswechselkontingent nicht betroffen ist, dann auch den Platz zu verlassen? Ja, ich weiß nicht, ob das unbedingt im Zusammenhang damit steht, weil man ja daran gar nicht so denkt. Also man möchte einfach weiterspielen äh, aus egoistischen Faktoren. Äh, da ist jetzt die Mannschaft, glaube ich, so ein bisschen eher hinten dran. Äh, aber trotzdem allein, dass das Thema groß ist und dass man sich dann nicht ähm, auswechseln lässt und als Weichei dargestellt wird, wenn man äh, einen Schlag in den Kopf bekommt, sondern dass das Thema jetzt größer wird und dass es wirklich was Ernstzunehmendes ist, und einfach, was so gefährlich ist. Also ich meine, in 99 Prozent der Fälle ist es wahrscheinlich nicht gefährlich, aber ähm, da 
damit sollte man einfach nicht Spaß und nicht spielen. Und äh, dadurch, dass das Thema einfach größer wird, glaube ich, äh, verlässt man dann schon mal schneller den Palatz, weil man irgendwo schon mal mitbekommen hat, dass das jetzt nicht so ohne ist. Dankeschön, Christoph. Thank you very much for being with us and all the best. Thank you. Auch so. Vielen Dank. We've already talked about him. He's one of the best goalkeepers of all time, Czech record national player, winning in total incredible 18 titles with Chelsea and Arsenal. So let's take a look at some highlights of Peter Czech's fantastic career. So Peter Czech is now joining us. We're so delighted. Peter, thank you very much. Um, how are you and where are you exactly? Looks like a nice view. Well, I'm in my office at the training ground with the first team just finished training. I was a part of the training today as well. So uh, now I, I go back to I got back to my uh, uh, suit and, and the office and, and we have a lovely day in London. So it's, it was actually a nice day. Which role did you play today? Well, I was in goal, <laughs> helping with the helping uh, with the goalkeepers. So today we needed a little bit more numbers to to make the session the way the the goalkeeper coach prepared. So I I helped them out, which is sometimes nice uh, for me because I'm, I'm uh, I keep fit and and uh, you know it sometimes refresh my mind as well. Peter, we've requested this interview also because we want to speak about concussions and head injuries. It's a serious topic. We've talked about it with FIFA's new medical director, Andrew Messi. And I mean, you have suffered some serious head injuries in your career. You had to overcome a fractured skull in 2006. It was horrible and yes, life threatening. You had several concussions. How did you personally cope with all these dangerous situations? I think you need to have the right support. You have to have the right understanding. And as well, uh, you need to have the right uh, mentality towards uh, the recovery, towards uh, you know, you know the, the advice you get. And um, I think it's very individual. But um, I believe that when you, get, uh, when you get the right guidance and the right support from the people around you, from the club, and from the medical team uh, and of course you have yourself uh, you have this drive and and inner energy to you know to follow and 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 come back because uh, that's that's ultimately what uh, what matters then i think um you you are guided by the way you you eliminate a lot of risk and and then you can um, you can come back of course there are cases where things are not happening as well uh, or people have the anxiety to return to playing and but as i said it's individual my my target was when i got injured was not to think if it's the end of my career that was the last thing i was thinking about i put it in my mind as an eventual possibility because that was a possibility so you have to just clear your mind and accept uh, the the options you have and the option number one of course was to do everything what was possible for me to do to return to pitch but the option number two was okay prepare for the worst and uh, and accept that it might not be possible to return in a plane but there are so many other things you can you can do so i put that in my mind but of course the priority of me and everybody was to uh, to return to the pitch and this was the first uh, what, what we've done. More and more competitions are now implementing the test phase for additional substitutions. What's the biggest advantage of such a possible additional substitution and how do you see the development now? I'm very happy to see to see these developments because if we if we remember the the medical team in, in terms of the concussion is under a lot of pressure during the game. Imagine you play a very important game and 
you need to be 11 v 11 you know you don't you don't you don't want people to be um disadvantaged for five minutes because in a top game in the elite sport you know even five seconds sometimes makes a big difference so you know you try to make the assessment as best as possible to protect the player but this these are the moments where you, the medical team is under a lot of pressure because obviously they know how it how much it means to the team and how much the manager needs the player and the the player himself wants to be you know involved and go back and as soon, as soon as possible because he's aware that you know if the team plays down to 10 men it might uh, it might be an issue so this concussion substitutes actually they take this away because you know when you know you will not your team is not down to 10 men that somebody helps out while you get properly assessed that you are not put under risk uh, that anybody else is put under risk because people have to realize as well that you know a, a concussed player might have a um, more difficult decision making and, and then you make a late tackle or or you can you know you can harm yourself or somebody else by making wrong judgment and in the high speed in the elite football you know this is actually quite um, uh, possible and, and and a realistic threat so you know these these uh, substitutes actually take away all this uh, element of uh, the pressure from the medical team because the team is not playing down to 10 men if the if the player is properly assessed and cannot return the other player is already in play and then you just put him in and and the game goes on and and i think i think this is actually probably the best way uh, forward because uh, you know, like that, we can assure the the best possible uh, assessment of the players and, and, and the health and safety of uh, everybody on the pitch. A true legend. Thank you very much, Peter. All the best also for the upcoming matches. Thank you very much for having me. Now we will show you some highlights of the recent Olympic football draw. And my fellow colleague Samantha Johnson had the chance to talk to Lindsay Tarpley two-time gold medalist from the US and Ryan Nelson, former team captain of New Zealand afterwards about their Olympic experiences. Hello and welcome to the draw for the Tokyo 2020. Japan. Netherlands. Brazil. USA. I think we are looking forward to extremely, extremely exciting matches. We have just moved one giant step closer to kickoff. Thank you for all watching and following the draw worldwide. Right, I'm very pleased to talk to two true legends here at the home of FIFA, Lindsay Topley and Ryan Nelson. Thank you very much for joining me. We've just had an amazing draw. Now, we did speak about this very briefly, um, about your experiences, you know, being mm -hmm. an Olympian, winning two gold medals. But can you just take us back to Athens all over again? <laughs> Athens, yes. Um, you know, one thing that I love about talking, talking about that term, tournament specifically is I was fortunate to take part in a Youth World Cup leading up to Athens, and it was a very critical time in my development as a player to understand what it was going to take at the highest level and how to train to be a world-class player. And if I wouldn't have had that experience, I'm, I would have had a harder time making the jump to the senior women's national team. And so by the age of 19, I was competing in Athens and ended up scoring a goal in the gold medal match. And a lot of that was because of what I learned going through the process um, as a youth and the development that I learned. 19, I feel like I've done nothing with my life. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, okay, so that's Athens. Can you take talk um, about Beijing mm -hmm. as well and the experiences you had in those Olympics? In Beijing, we actually lost our opening match against Norway. And so starting the tournament, obviously not how we had envisioned it, but it was time to figure it out for us. And we left that game and figured out um, a way to get to the final. And it made us that much stronger throughout the tournament. And so sometimes looking at these Olympic draws, you have to understand that you're going to face very, very good competition. And it's a, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. We just had an amazing draw for the men's and the women's. Uh, what stood out for you? I think the, um, the group on the women's side, mm -hmm. Group G, I think, stands out for me the most. I mean, probably from the women's side, you, you want to avoid the USA, right? 
I mean, they are being phenomenal. <laughs> look, look at that smile. Look. You're unavoidable. <laughs> Pretty don't much. avoid it. <laughs> <Love> it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, with Sweden, one of the one of the better teams in the tournament as well. Sweden matched up with the US, and then you've got the down under duo of Australia and New Zealand that will be kind of uh, a rivalry inside a little group as well. It's a really exciting kind of group. Um, that's one that I'll be really looking forward to watching. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about you um, as a player, as a former player. What? have been your your best memories of playing at the Olympics? Well, I think it's... Um, the Olympics is completely different to when you play you know, in, the, in the English Premier League or, or even the World Cup or Confederations Cup and was or all those kind of Europa and all that. It's, it, that's a job that feels it's very kind of, it's in a way, kind of commercial. It's, you've got a job to do. When you go to the Olympics, it's, you're Olympian and it's not just football, it's also other sports and other mm-hmm. athletes and there's a real chemistry, there's real mm-hmm. athletic chemistry around, uh, around the village, around the city, around wherever, you know, it's amazing. And you do get caught up with that. And to say you're an Olympian is like, you know, I, I can't say I'm a double gold medal <laughs> like, <laughs> like Lindsay can. Neither but can I. I can't <laughs> say, I, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> but yeah, we're not that lucky. <laughs> but, uh, well, luck had nothing to do with it. But, um, but just to be able to say it is kind of an experience what, you know, you, know, you kind of grow up watching on TV. And, you, you know, for me, I just thought it would never, ever happen. It's just kind of beyond amazing. And to be able to, to do it, it's, it's, it's pretty special. Okay, let's turn our attentions back to the women's game. And I suppose the next uh, Women's World Cup is going to be New Zealand um, and Australia. For the first time, we're going to have 32 teams. Can you just give us an insight into how important this is for the growth of the women's game? It's well, effectively a home games for you as well. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, it's, I, th- I think you, you, you touched on it. 32 teams is, first of all, fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's great. That gives 32 countries 32 young ladies looking up um, inspiring kind of athletes and and that's really important for the growth of the game we've we've seen it go from 2019 was amazing Mm. Um, I know 2023 hopefully will be even better Um, and I know the countries I know Australia New Zealand they they love women's sport they love their soccer they love sporting fans so they will embrace it and I think having 32 teams is more global, more eyes on it, mm. and that's exciting. Mm. And, that, and it's something to build on as well. I mean, 2019 uh, in France, that was the most successful Women's World mm-hmm. Cup. And it's just going to get better and better, mm-hmm. isn't it? I think so. I mean, you look back at um, how far we've come with the women's game. And by 2026, it, they're expecting over 60 million young, young women to be playing. And that's amazing to have that many people involved with the game. Okay. Guys, thank you so much. It's been rather emotional doing the draw with you. <laughs> Brilliant. I hope to see you very soon. Uh, again, thank you to my guests, my legends, uh, Ryan and uh, Lindsay. And we're very much looking forward to the Olympic football tournament in Tokyo. And of course, to the next big women FIFA highlight the World Cup in 2023 and I hope to see you all there. The Olympic football tournament starts on July 21st and for the fourth time in a row Honduras will be taking part. The football country from Central America was the first CONCACAF member to qualify for Tokyo. Honduras was also affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Football Federation used FIFA's grants also to keep the dream of the Olympics alive. Realmente FIFA Forward ha, ha venido a suponer un cambio muy importante, no solamente en la forma de pensar, de desarrollar la infraestructura, sino también de cómo se ejecutan los proyectos. Hemos tenido siempre el acompañamiento de FIFA. Como hondureño, como dirigente de fútbol, un alto agradecimiento para el presidente Infantino en haber confiado en Honduras, estar haciendo este apoyo importante que prácticamente es económico también porque con ese dinero pues están haciendo muchas inversiones en lo que es el fútbol, en lo que es las instalaciones deportivas, apoyando casi a todos los, los niveles del el deporte. Tenemos una cancha sintética, un mini estadio en Tegucigalpa y ahora la, la casa de la H 
donde estamos en este momento, que tiene una cancha deportiva, las instalaciones del hotel, más las zonas de hidroterapia y también eh, lo que es el gimnasio. Así que esto va a ser, nos va a servir para el desarrollo de todo, tanto juvenil, infantil, eh, femenino y mayor. Eh, nosotros siempre estamos eh, que se debe apoyar lo que es el sector menor, un proceso que, que traiga desde niños de 6 años hasta los 18 y luego vienen las otras categorías. Creo que, que es una de las cosas pues, que en países como los nuestros están haciendo diferencia para poder desarrollar el fútbol a través de este programa de FIFA Forward. Así que eh, felicitar a la FIFA, felicitar a, a todas las personas que trabajan eh, por estos proyectos y por todo lo que estamos haciendo en parte de infraestructura y también en la parte del desarrollo del fútbol a nivel nacional, en este caso de Honduras, y a nivel de toda la zona de CONCACAF. Football is coming back to life also in Central America. In our forthcoming episodes, we'll continue to showcase the myriad projects that FIFA and the FIFA Foundation are developing, supporting and funding all around the world. We are very happy that we found a way to bring you this episode of Living Football. It's more than just a slogan, it's in our hearts. That's it for today. See you again in two weeks' time. Till then, all the best.